Alrighty, good morning everyone. I hope we're doing well. So we're going to dive into our assignment two animation recreation one tutorial today. And we need to start off in Illustrator because we need to make the assets we're actually going to be animating. So let's do that. Dive into Illustrator and let's select the HDTV 1080 preset here. It's the last option before the more preset button. And that will then open a new document for us. It is uh, giving us some guides. So these are our action safe title guides. Don't let those get in the way or confuse you. And if we come over to properties, you'll see that your transparency grid has been turned on. That's why we've got these checkerboards in the background, just to show that there's no visual information. So you can turn that on and off as you please. Um, but we're going to be working on top of a reference image today. So I don't think we need to worry too much about that right now. It might come in handy that we leave it on a little bit later. All right, so first things first, let's import the um, reference image that we'll be using. So that's file, place, and then simply select the screenshot that we downloaded from Canvas. I'm not gonna turn on the template option today. I'm just gonna leave it as it is. So just selecting the cre uh, screenshot and saying place. Now you'll notice in Illustrator, whenever you move your mouse around, you now have a thumbnail of the image following along. And that just means that you can either click to place the image and it gets imported at its sort of like native size. Alternatively, if I do that again, you can also click and drag to place the scale itself. So I'm just going to click and drag from the top left corner to the bottom right corner of my artboard. Kind of see it there and place this image nice and big. Okay, so for our animation, we need eight layers. We've got two white circles, white square and a white rectangle. But if we take a look at our reference footage, we can see that there is also going to be more assets later down the line of different colors. Uh, if I find that quickly here, so you can see that depending on what sort of background color we have, we have either the white assets or the red and black assets. So we need to have copies of both. All right. So I'm going to lock my layer in Illustrator. I'm going to come down and create a new layer by clicking on the new layer button at the bottom of the layers tab. And let's start drawing out these shapes. I'm going to grab my rectangle tool and I'm going to turn my fill off. I'll leave the stroke as black and I'll leave the thickness as one for now. We'll be adjusting these a bit later, but just so we can actually see what we're working on top of. I'm just going to draw this out and position these lines as best I can. Now you'll see that the outline on this layer is red. So that's being a little, making it a little bit difficult to see uh, the actual outline of the shape on this red background. So let's quickly dive over to the layers tab again, double click on the thumbnail next to layer two's name, and you can just change the color code to something that's a bit easier to see on red. So if we then reselect our shapes, we now have blue outline instead. Okay, so we've got our initial rectangle. We're gonna use these floating um, white dots inside the corners to round out that shape. And there we've got our rounded rectangle. Let us then grab our square tool again and holding down shift, click and drag to create a perfect square. We don't need to worry about rounding out those corners there. Then we're gonna grab the ellipse tool and we are going to make a large circle. Use my arrow keys to just reposition it and I can obviously scale it up or down if I need to. And then small circle. Same thing, kind of just reposition it using my arrow keys. And there we are. We've now got our shapes. So what I'm going to do is I am going to just select all my shapes and I'm going to just push them over to the left here so I can actually see them once I start changing their colors correctly. So first things first, let's grab our rectangle and our square. And we're going to come over to properties and increase our stroke thickness to three points. And we'll change our stroke color to white. Next thing we're going to do is grab our two circles and I'm going to hit I for the eyedrop tool. And I'm just going to click to sample the white from our reference image. And there it applies white to our fill and removes the stroke. And that's looking pretty good. Okay. Once we've got our shapes, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to drag and select all of them, hold down option or alt and click and drag. I'm just going to pull their copies all the way across to the right of the screen. And these ones are going to have different colors. So I can simply grab again the square and the rectangle. Let's change their stroke to black. 
and then let's grab our two circles and I for the eyedrop tool and I'm just going to sample this red color that we have in the background. All right, and that then applies that color fill to our circles. So if we come on over to our layers tab and we turn off layer one, which had our reference image on it, we now have copies. So we've got two versions of each shape and they're all different colors. Quite nice. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to align these on top of each other so that we essentially place them in the scene so we don't have to do that when we dive into After Effects. So I'm just going to click and drag to select all eight of my shapes. I'm going to come over to Properties and I'm going to come down to the Align function. Now by default when you have assets like this selected it says uh, it is set Align to Selection. So what would happen is if we were to click align, they would just jump on top of each other. That's fine. But I want us to also be able to have it centered at the middle of the artboard. So we're actually going to change that align selection to align to artboard. And even though it does the same thing, at least you now know that you can change what you're aligning your assets to as well. All right. And with that, they are now placed in the center of the screen, ready to be uh, seen in After Effects. The last thing that we need to do, however, before we can dive into After Effects is we need to place all of these layers on their own main layers. So right now, After Effects can't register or doesn't understand sub layers. So if we take a look at our layer tab, we obviously have all of our shape sub layers inside of one main layer. After Effects only reads those main layers. So each of these shapes needs to be on their own main layer. So what I'm going to do is I am going to first just delete layer one. That's my reference image. I no longer need that. So I'm just going to hit the trash can icon there. It's going to tell me that it contains artwork. That's fine. I'm just going to say yes and commit it to the void. Then I'm going to create eight new layers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we are then going to start transplanting these assets onto their own main layers. So I'm just going to go sort of from the top of this um, totem hierarchy that we have here down to the bottom. So we're going to grab our red circle first. I can see that that's this layer here in the layers tab because of this little square that is being highlighted to show it has been selected. And I can click and drag to drop that sub layer on its own main layer. And I'm going to call that small red circle. Then I'm going to grab the outlines for my black rectangle or black square rather and drop that onto the layer below. So that goes onto layer nine and we'll call this black square. Next up is the big red circle. So that will go onto layer eight below the black square. We'll call that big red circle. And then our black rectangle will go on the layer below that. And we'll label it thus. Then I can turn the visibility on, uh, I mean off, sorry, for those layers that we've now just moved across. That's also a good way to check that we haven't accidentally put more assets on one layer at a time. Should only be one shape disappearing as you turn those eye icons off. We're then going to do the same for all of the white shapes. So we'll drop the small white circle onto layer six. Call it small white circle. Then we have the white square below that. Then we have our big white circle. And then we have the round rectangle. I'll just dump that onto the layer above and call that white rectangle. Okay. So now everything should be on their own main layers. We can turn the visibility off of these to check as well. And that's looking fine. They appear to be done. I have one remaining layer, layer two. So I don't want an empty layer being brought into After Effects unnecessarily. So we're just going to delete that as well. And then another good habit to get into is to color label our actual layers in Illustrator. Even though those color labels don't transfer to After Effects, it is good practice, especially when working with a complicated file, to color group areas that sort of um, associate with one another if they're going to be moving, essentially. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my small red circle, black square, big red circle, and black rectangle. So that's all my current shapes that I can see on screen. And I'm going to come on up to this kebab icon or this uh, burger icon here. Click on there and we're going to select options for selection. 
and this is going to allow me to change the color of those layers. Let's just make them light red again for all four of those layers at once. Saves me having to do one at a time. So we'll do the same for the small white circle down to the white rectangle. So those are all of my white assets now. Same thing on that burger button and select options for selection. And let's make those pink today. All right, and with that, our assets are now ready to be imported into After Effects. Let's save this file so we can come on up to File, Save As. That's going to allow us to give it a name. I'm just gonna save mine to desktop and I'm going to call these Recreation One Assets. All right, that way I know that this is the file that I'm using for that specific assignment. So I don't recommend saving it to your desktop. I do this simply for the classes, but I do recommend having a folder dedicated for these files as you're progressing through the term. We are working on a lot of projects, so do have some sort of filing system involved. It's gonna say save. It's gonna pop up on my illustration options window here. We don't need to change anything at all. Nothing here needs to be adjusted. So we're just gonna say okay. And that file has now been saved. Cool. I'm then going to minimize Illustrator and we'll dive into After Effects. All right, so now that we have dived into After Effects, we're greeted with our home page. We're just going to click on New Project and we're going to click on New Composition. It's been a while since we've been in After Effects, so let's take a look at our composition settings. Uh, let me just reset mine so that it's the same as yours there. So our preset is going to be HDTV 1080-25. That can be found towards the bottom portion of our selection drop down here. And with that setting selected, or with that preset selected rather, it automatically sets our width to 1920, our height to 1080, and our pixel aspect ratio to square pixels. Lastly, it also says that our frame rate is gonna be 25 frames a second. Resolution, we can leave it full. Start time code, we don't need to worry about, but the duration, I need you to please make sure that your, the duration of your animation is five seconds and 10 frames long. So your duration will read 0, 0, 0, 0, 005, 10. We can leave our background color as black for now, and I'm going to say OK. Cool. Next, we're going to then import our reference footage. So we're gonna come down to uh, File, Import File. And let's grab the uh, recreation1.mp4 reference video that was downloaded from Canvas. And I'm just gonna make sure that I've turned off create composition. I don't want this to be placed in its own little composition window. So just select that video and say open and it gets added to our project panel. Then we need our Illustrator file. So again, file, import, file, and let's select the recreation1assets.ai file that we've just saved. Now before we say open, we need to remember to change import as from footage to composition retain layer sizes. Very important step that we do this. If you ever forget which one, just go for the longest option available. Composition retain layer sizes. And uh, I'm gonna leave create composition turned off, that's fine. We're just gonna say open and we then have two new things being added to our project panel. The first one is the composition itself. We can simply double click on that and uh, that will then open up in our viewing panel. And these are the layers that we're actually going to be animating today. Below that, we then have the folder that includes the layers that we've now imported, but these layers are just for After Effects to reference. So I've stressed this in the past, but just to reiterate that, do not mess with these layers. The only time we interact with these is when a link is broken and we need to repair it. Otherwise, we leave them as they are. Okay, so right now in our timeline, we have got Recreation 1 assets open. We can see we've got layers one down to eight. They've retained the order that we um, set up in Illustrator and they've got the labels, uh, the, the textual labels at least, that we set up in Illustrator as well. So let's quickly set up our colors here too. I'm gonna select layers one to four and I'm gonna color label those in yellow today. And then I'm going to select layers five to eight and I'm going to color label those in green today. All right. So the yellow layers refer to the small red and black assets and the green layers refer to the white assets. Now, we're struggling to see our black outlines on screen at the moment, obviously because our background color is black. So there's one of two ways we can go about just working with this. The first way is to come down to the bottom of your viewing panel, 
So uh, just next to this lightning bolt icon, there is another toggle transparency button, very similar to the one that we have in Illustrator. And clicking on that will then turn our background invisible, essentially, showing us that that color does in fact not exist. It's just a placeholder. And we can actually then see what we're working on. Now, me personally, my eyes are quite weak, so this gives me a bit of a headache to stare at for long hours at a time. So I'm gonna keep that turned off, but if you're fine working on top of it, by all means, go ahead. Instead, I'm just gonna change the color of my background. So I'm gonna hit Command or Control K. That's Command or Control K, and that opens up your composition settings. And we're just gonna change our background to a dark gray, to something like that. And I can now see my shapes a little bit better. All right, cool. Then the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to bring our recreation one video. So that's our reference footage down into the timeline. We're gonna put that at the very top of the layer stack. Uh, I'm gonna turn the audio off for that layer just by clicking on the little audio button there. And let's color code this in red for today. We can also increase its scale. So I'm gonna hit S for scale, and I'm going to type in a value of 301%, so 301% scale. That has our shape filling the entire screen, or our layer rather, filling the entire screen. And now you can actually scrub through and see what it is that we're going to be making today. So don't get confused by the color changes at the moment. We'll get to that at the end of the lesson. But what I want you to kind of notice is regardless of what color the assets are, whether it's the large white circle or the large red circle, they're doing the same thing, right? So we can actually get away with only animating one set of these assets. And uh, if we do a little bit of parenting, we then don't need to worry about animating the rest. So let's just uh, turn off our reference footage again. And we are going to parent the green layers. So those are our white assets to their corresponding yellow layers. So layer six will be parented to layer two. Remember that in order to parent, we have our pick whip tool to the right of the sort of text side of the layer um, panel, as well as this little drop down where you could actually go and choose as well. I just prefer the pick whip. So layer six parented to layer two, layer seven parented to layer three, layer eight parented to layer four, and layer nine parented to layer five. All right. And this means that wherever the red circle goes, the white circle below it will follow. All right, so that means that we only need to worry about animating the red and black shapes, and then those will drive the uh, green layers below. Now that we've done our parenting, I'm going to select layers six down to nine, and I am going to turn off their visibility just so that we don't see them while we're working with the rest of our shapes. And I'm also gonna make them shy Remember, we have this little mushroom looking button to the right of their name. And then to activate the shy function, we're gonna turn on that shy feature. And that saves us some space in our timeline. So we have more real estate to work with. All right, let us then take a look at what we're going to be recreating. So we're gonna build this one piece at a time. We're gonna start off by doing the rounded rectangle. Once that's done, we'll then do the large circle, then the square, then the small circle. So the round rectangle bounces on screen, it scales up as it does so, and its rotation changes as well. Big red circle jumps on top of that. We then have the rotating square jumping into screen, rotating across the top of that circle. Obviously we have that small circle doing the exact same thing. And then they scale up and disappear. All right, so we're gonna do all of that, and then we're gonna do the color jumps so that we get that cool sort of flashing color change. All right, so first things first, what we're gonna do is we're going to be making heavy use of our guides today. So you can either hit Command or Control R or you can come up to View and you can turn on Show Rulers. You'll see the shortcut there is Command or Control R. And I'm gonna be using my rulers to just plot out where my shapes need to be on screen. I'm also going to be using the little um, comp marker bin, this little bookmark looking icon. We're quite familiar with this, hopefully by now, from our lip sync animation last term. So remember that we can use these to place markers on our timeline, and that's going to allow me to then plot out when it hits the ground or when it's doing whatever it is doing, so I don't have to keep jumping back and forth to the reference. Okay, so let's plot out what our rounded rectangle starts off doing. So we can see that it starts coming on screen, it's quite small, rotating anti-clockwise, and it hits 
what is essentially going to be called the ground at 11 frames. And I can see my frames here in this preview time box at the bottom of my viewing panel. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to drag and drop a ruler guide down. And I'm gonna place that at the bottom left corner there just so I can see where the shape is touching. And I'm also going to place a little bookmark icon on the timeline on frame 11 so I know that this is where that contact takes place. All right, now you'll notice that the size of our shape changes as soon as it hits that floor and it continues to grow up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the sort of initial positioning of our rounded rectangle, and then we're gonna go back and do the rotation and the scale, and then we'll make final adjustments to the positions so that it sits correctly. All right, but let's keep plotting this out. So moving forward across the timeline, we get to one, uh, sorry, frame 18. So at frame 18, I've got my next timeline marker, and this is where the shape has bounced up into the air so I'll place another guide down there. It then begins to fall and lands on the ground at one second, one frame. Place another timeline marker there and place a ruler guide there. It then jumps ever so slightly into the air. So we're gonna call that at one second, five frames. I'm gonna place my marker there and I will place another ruler guide down there. And then finally, it comes into contact with the floor for the last time on one second, 11 frames. So I'll place a timeline marker there and a ruler marker so I can denote that. All right, so we're gonna have five position keyframes. Uh, well, technically six, because we need one at the very beginning. But yeah, we've now plotted out the actual movement of this shape. So let's go on and just turn off the visibility for all of my layers except layer five, the black rectangle. And uh, let's just quickly set up its scale and rotation to look somewhat correct from the reference video. So first off, we're gonna hit P for position, and then we're gonna hold down shift and hit S for scale. And still holding down shift, we're gonna hit R for rotation. And that brings up my values there. Without creating any keyframes just yet, we're first going to change the rotation value to minus seven degrees. And we are then going to unlink our scale and we're going to change the first scale value to 50. So now we have got the small shape that we see rolling in. Now you'll see that as you sort of scale that shape down, the rounded, the corner of its edges get um, squashed. Don't stress about that. That's just the way that the file, the illustrator layer is reacting to being transformed. It's not something that you'll be penalized for. There's no real way around that at this stage. Okay, so we've got a rotation value of minus seven. We've got a scale value of 50, 100. Let's go to the very beginning of the timeline and create a keyframe by clicking on our stopwatch there. And our shape needs to move all the way up. I'm just holding down shift to make sure it moves up in a straight line. And that's gonna be sitting up here in space like so. I'm just gonna hit Command or Control R to get rid of my rulers and have a bit more screen space. Okay, so my shape is now floating in midair for its first appearance or first keyframe. We're then going to go down to frame 11. This is where our shape falls into the screen and it touches our second guide. All right, so we're just gonna have it touch that second ruler guide there. And something that's going to uh, cause us a little bit of problems is these handles that are being made. So you might notice on this path now that there are these slightly larger dots. After Effects could definitely do something to make them a bit more visible. But once you learn how to recognize them, they, they are quite easy to see. And these handles are gonna cause us a little bit of a problem in a moment. So let's see how, and then we can figure out how to fix that. So I'm gonna move on over to frame 18, and this is where my shape bounces straight back up into the air. So we're gonna have it then touching our first ruler guide. Now, this is where that issue occurs. If I kind of just select my shape, you'll see that, uh, let me just re like select this key here so I can get rid of the handle. You'll see that we've got this tail that has now been formed. And if we go back to our second position keyframe and shift down the timeline by two frames, one, two, you'll see that instead of going straight up into the air, it instead kind of overshoots and then moves upwards. So 
this is a direct result of the handles that are being made. If I kind of drag that out, you can actually see that it's trying to extend that line. So very similar to when we're working in Illustrator and we're working with the pen tool and uh, creating a curved path that tries to help us, but it actually gets in the way. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab our pen tool, click and hold and select the convert vertex tool. And with that, we are going to click on these little square uh, empty square icons that we see here that represent the keyframes and that removes our handles for us. All right, so now it's going to go straight down and then straight back up again. We're gonna to have to do this for every shape that goes straight down and straight back up or vice versa uh, because those handles will be a problem. But as soon as we remove the handles from the path for a layer, After Effects gets the idea and it doesn't add any more for us. Okay. So let's move on down then to one second, one frames on the timeline. And this is where our shape is going to hit that fourth ruler that we've placed. Then we're going to go to one second, five frames, and it bounces up into the air slightly. So it's now touching the third ruler on screen. And then finally, we come to one second, 11 frames, and our shape touches that last ruler there. Okay. So we have six keyframes, and if you play that back, we've got a fairly boring little bounce going on. Let us then now take a look at our reference footage to see what happens with the rotation and the scale. I think we'll do the rotation next, and then we'll do the scaling. So we can see that our shape rotates in counterclockwise, so it kind of tumbles in on screen, and then it gets stuck in this uh, off-kilter position. So that's our negative seven degrees that we've already set and then it only slaps down flat as we hit the ground at one second, one frame. So this is fairly simple to do. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to move my timeline indicator to 11 frames, and I'm gonna make my first rotation keyframe, and that value is minus seven degrees. So that just locks in our current pose that we've been using to help place the shape. We're then gonna go back to the very beginning of the timeline and we're gonna type in a value of 180. Okay, so we now have a keyframe at the very beginning of the timeline at 180 degrees, and that has our shape rotating counterclockwise until it gets onto the screen like so. Okay, then what we're going to do is we are going to apply toggle hold to our second keyframe. So the, the rotation keyframe that reads minus seven, we're going to right click that keyframe and select toggle hold. And that's going to tell it, don't change your value until another keyframe tells you to. So you'll see it doesn't affect the initial rotation that we have, but that's going to allow us when we get to one second, one frame to add a third rotation keyframe of zero degrees. And suddenly it looks as though the shape only snaps into that sort of flat space once it overlaps on uh, frame one second, one frame. So on one second, nothing, one second, one frame, it snaps forward. All right, so using toggle hold, we've then allowed us to create that snapping effect. Cool. And then we need to do our scale. So we're gonna be using a toggle hold keyframe for scale as well. You'll notice that as our shape rotates into screen, it doesn't increase at all in scale until it hits that um, 11th frame. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is you can place this um, keyframe anywhere really, but I'm gonna put it at the very beginning of the timeline. Let's go to the beginning of the timeline and create our first scale keyframe. That reads 50, 100, and we're going to apply toggle hold keyframe to that. So this is just going to tell us to keep that scale until we get to frame 11. At frame 11 on the timeline, I'm then going to change my values to read 75, 100, and it is already set to toggle hold because it's following along from the previous one. And what we're going to do is we're going to hold down command or control and we're going to just click on that second keyframe and that turns it back into a diamond. So even though it maintains that toggle hold from the initial key, we are going to have it scale up over the next couple of frames. So I'm going to move my indicator then to frame 18 and I'm going to change my scale to 100, 100. And now we have got the rotation and the scaling of that shape done as well. The last thing we need to do is just adjust its positions. I'd recommend that we save just in case. 
I'm just going to call it one for today. And now because we've made some changes to the scaling, we are going to have to make some changes to our position. So I'm just going to go to frame 11 and I'm going to shift my shape up slightly now that it's increased in size, just making sure that the shape continues to touch that guide with its lower corner. And then going to go on to frame 18 and I can see that that needs to go up slightly. We'll then go to one second, one frame, bring that down slightly to be touching our guide there. At um, one second, five frames, bring it down to touch our third guide on the screen. And then lastly, one second, 11 frames, make sure that it is touching there. Okay, and with that, we have now completed the shape. We just need to go, uh, sort of dive into the graph editor and uh, it'll be good to go. So let's do that. Um, again, I recommend saving if you haven't already. Let us then just select our position keyframes and I am going to hit F9 to apply easing. Alternatively, right click on one of those uh, blue keyframes and select keyframe assistant, easy ease. All right, and with that done, they now all look like hourglasses. We're gonna dive into the graph editor and uh, we should be looking at what looked like a bunch of speed bumps. So remember, this is the speed graph. If you're looking at something like this, this is the value graph, this red and green line here. I've personally not really worked with the value graph, so we're just gonna right click anywhere in the graph editor and select edit speed graph. Okay, and then whenever our shape hits the ground, so it's going to essentially be every second keyframe, that's where we're going to have our sharp peaks occurring. So I'm going to go to frame 11, that's my second keyframe, and create my first peak there. And I can zoom in and just move down the timeline so I can see these a bit better. Uh, at one second, one frame, that's gonna be our next peak. And hopefully you guys understand that these peaks are occurring uh, when the shape hits the ground, right? So that's when it's really sort of traveling at its maximum speed. And then at the very end, we'll just have a peak to the right there. All right, so when you play that back, it should bounce quite nicely. Cool. Let's go out of the graph editor and let's do scaling next. So even though we've got toggle hold applied to our first scale frame, we can still do some easing with the second and the third one. So I'm just gonna grab those two keyframes there for scale. Slap on some easing by hitting F9 and let's go into the graph editor. For this, all I'm gonna do is just grab the last keyframe available. So that's R1 to the right here. And I'm just gonna move my values to the left-hand side and that's gonna cause a nice pop with our scale. So that occurs quite quickly as it scales out. All right, so if we play that back, pops up quite nicely and then plonks into position. Then the last thing we're going to do is a little bit of easing on our very first rotation keyframe. So it's looking fine as it is, but it could definitely be a, a little nicer. Um, so we're just going to apply easing to the very first rotation keyframe. And if we dive into the graph editor, that looks something like this. And all we're going to do is just push our handle to the right slightly. And that just has the rotation occur quite slowly until it speeds up just before it hits the ground. And that just adds a little bit of visual interest there. All right, let's do our big circle next. So to start off with, we're going to just get rid of our guides that are currently on the screen here. So we're going to come up to view and we are going to select clear guides. That gets rid of those cyan lines in our viewing panel. And I'm also just going to pull the timeline markers off the screen so I can make way for new ones. All right, so in our reference, we can see that our ball bounces in from the top of the screen as well, and it first appears on frame 23. So I'm gonna put a timeline marker on frame 21. Yeah, sorry, it's frame 22 that it first appears there. So timeline marker on frame 21, and then we have our ball fall into the screen. Now, in our reference footage, we don't see the ball actually make contact with the shape. And that's fine. In our animation, we will have that actually sort of make contact. So it looks as though it's bouncing off of it. So we can call this making contact at one second, one frame. I'm just going to put a little marker there. 
and then it bounces up into the air gets to the top of that bounce at uh, let's call it one second five frames one second six frames sorry one second six frames gets to the top of its bounce i'm going to hit command or control r to bring up my rulers and just place a guide for where it has now lifted into the air then starts falling makes contact again on frame 111 so one second 11 frames and then bounces up slightly gets to the top of that bounce at let's call it one second 15 frames i'm going to place a little guide there and then finally makes contact and comes to rest at one second 19 frames okay so let's then turn off layer one, our reference footage. We can then lock and collapse layer five. Let's bring up our big red circles visibility and let's go to frame 21. I'm gonna hit P for position, create my first position keyframe and drag the ball all the way up off the screen. I'll hit command or control R to remove my rulers as well. All right. Then we're going to move on to one second, one frame. This is where our ball comes into contact with the rounded rectangle for the first time. So I'm just going to use my arrow keys to help me place it there. We then move on to one second, six frames. Our ball goes straight up into the air. And again, we need to grab our convert vertex tool and get rid of the handles that are being made by our keyframes. Cool. With that done, we're then going to move on to one second, 11 frames, and our ball will make contact again. Move on to one second, 15 frames. It bounces up into the air slightly, and then it comes to rest at one second, 19 frames. And there we go. I am going to clear my guides. And let's see how we can make this look a little bit more interesting than what we currently have. So we're gonna grab all of our position keyframes here and we're gonna apply our easing. We're gonna dive into the graph editor and just as we did for the rounded rectangle, we are going to have our peaks occur whenever our asset touches the shape below it. So whenever the ball hits that rounded rectangle, we are going to have a peak And as we make those peaks, it will naturally create the troughs when our ball is sort of hanging in midair. And a little peak at the end. All right. If you play that back, you'll be able to tell if you've done it right. Obviously, it's not going to slow down just before it hits the shape below. And thanks to our nice peaks, we now have a very nice looking bounce. Okay, cool. That's it for this shape for now. So once again, I'm just going to clear off these timeline guides. And we're gonna move on to our square next. So the square pops in from the bottom of the screen. We can see that it kind of appears from behind something. So we'll come back to this a little bit later. But for now, I'm going to place my timeline marker on one second, four frames. That's where we'll have our first position key Sorry, one second, five frames. Yo, my eyes are clearly not working today. Um, all right, it then bounces into the air and comes to the sort of apex of that jump at, let's call it one second, 18 frames. And I'm just going to bring up my rulers again and I'm just gonna place this ruler kind of in the center of my square reference. Our rotation won't be exactly the same, so that'll be fine there. And uh, then we land on top of our circle at one second, 24 frames. So we'll place a little marker there. All right, and then it sways back and forth. So I think what we'll do is let's bring the square on screen first and then we'll worry about that. So let's uh, then turn off our reference footage, grab layer three, and we're going to go to one second, five frames on the timeline, hit P for position, and create our first keyframe. We're going to bring our square all the way down to the bottom so that it's sitting completely off screen. Okay, we're then going to move to one second 18 frames and we're going to move it straight back up again 
and uh, we'll just let it center in the middle of that guide. And then it needs to come down and touch the circle. And once again, because we have our anchor points creating those, or rather the uh, keyframes creating those handles, we need our convert vertex tool to get rid of those. And now we have a jumping on screen. All right. Next, let's go back to one second, five frames, and we're going to hold down shift and hit R for rotation and create our first rotation keyframe at zero degrees. And then we're gonna move on over to one second, 24 frames. So that's below our third position keyframe. And we're gonna type in a value of 180. And that will now have our square rotating clockwise as it jumps onto the screen. Okay, let's grab all of our keyframes. We can just slap some easing onto those. Oops, accidentally affect the ones below them. Um, just those there. And then we can just grab one of the position keyframes and uh, dive into the graph editor. So we're not having our sort of uh, square hit anything. It's not bouncing off anything. So we're just gonna go over to its second keyframe and we're gonna create our trough here. And this will allow it to hang in the air for quite a nice sort of amount of time there. So it pops on screen and then sort of loses fighter gravity and slams down onto the circle below. Okay, we can then do the graph for rotation. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to have our right hand keyframe. We're gonna grab its handle and just push it all the way to the left. Just so that a majority of the rotation occurs as it's appearing on screen and then it eases into its sort of final rotation and lands. All right, now that we've got that done, what we can do is move on to the swaying back and forth that we see in our square. So in our reference footage, we can see that immediately after landing, two frames later, it kind of just ticks over to the side. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a timeline marker on two seconds, one frame. It holds that position until frame 210, so two seconds, 10 frames and then it rolls across and comes into its resting position at, what's that? Two seconds, 22 frames. Holds that position for a little while and starts then rotating back from frame three, 10. So let's call that three seconds, 10 frames. And then it comes to rest at 317, so three seconds, 17 frames. Okay, so in order to create this illusion of the square rolling back and forth, we're going to need to sort of uh, create a, a new layer to help us control the square a little bit better. Right now, if we were to simply try and rotate it, it's not really gonna look as though it's actually rolling across the circle. It would look as though it's just kind of rotating around its center mass. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna come up to layer, new, and we are going to make a null object. So that's layer, new, null object. And I'm just going to color this null object purple for today. And uh, we're gonna use this null object to help us with that uh, rotating motion. So for those that don't remember, a null object is essentially an invisible piece of information and it acts as a controller. So think of it as a string attached to a puppet limb. We're gonna use this, we're just gonna plop it in the top, uh, top left corner there and scale it out to sit directly on top of our square. You can move it by clicking and dragging its anchor point there. And uh, then what we're gonna do is we need to come down and grab the layer five. And we are going to sort of see where its anchor point is here in the center of the big red circle. We're gonna click and drag and make a crosshair with our guides so that we can see where the center of the circle is. And then I can just lock layer five and collapse it there. Okay, so we've got this cross here in the center of our circle. I'm going to select my null, grab my pan behind tool, shortcut for that is Y, and we're just gonna move our anchor point to the center of the big red circle. This is going to allow us to have that null rotate around the edge of that circle. 
Then we need to parent layer four to layer one. So our black square is going to be parented to that null. Um, so I'm going to select layer four, grab my pick whip tool and drag and drop onto layer one. Let's rename that layer as square null. And then let's move that layer down to sit directly on top of layer four, just so that they're right next to each other. Okay, so layer one has now become layer three, square null and below that is the black square. Now I want you to hit R for rotation and you'll see that if you kind of just play around with the rotation for layer three, our square now slides around the edge of the circle. It's pretty cool. Cool. Let's now start creating our keyframes. So at one second, 24 frames, we're gonna make our first rotation keyframe for layer three. And we can sort of preemptively apply some easing to that. And then we're gonna move over to two seconds, one frame. And on layer three, we're gonna change our rotation value to five degrees. And layer four, we're gonna change our rotation value to 183 degrees. Yeah, so five degrees for layer, uh, layer three, 183 degrees for layer four. And that has it now rolling over. Coming over then to two seconds, 10 frames, we can create some empty keyframes here. So you can do that by either copying and pasting these keys or by simply coming across and clicking on these empty keyframe buttons for rotation to the far left of the timeline. That then just creates a keyframe with that values, uh, sort of current value there. Okay. So it holds that position there. Moving on to two seconds, 22 frames, we're gonna change the rotation value of layer three to negative five. And we're gonna change the rotation value of layer four to 177, 177. And that has our rolling effect. Moving down the timeline to three seconds, 10 frames, we can then create empty rotation keyframes there. So at three seconds, 10 frames, our rotation value for layer three is still negative five and layer four is still plus 177. And then going to three seconds, 17 frames, we can then bring layer three back to zero degrees and we can bring layer four back to 180 degrees. So zero degrees layer three and 180 on layer four. Okay, and that has our square rolling back and forth. It looks a little rigid, so we're going to dive into the graph editor and just take care of that as well. So let us then just grab, because they're both rolling in the same direction at the same time, we can do them both in the graph editor at the same time. Uh, so let's grab rotation keys from both layer three and layer four, and let's dive in here. Okay, so this first little loop that we've got is kind of where it falls over to the right for the first time. There's not much we can do here with such a short amount of, of time, only two frames. So we can actually just leave that as it is. And we're gonna come on over to when it rolls across to the left. And what we're gonna do here is I'm just gonna click and drag so that I can select the handle for both of the keyframes that are there. And I'm gonna have a little bit of easing out and a little bit of easing in. So we just make a little bit of a speed bump and that allows it to sort of just ease out of its roll, pick up speed and then ease into its next position. We're gonna do the same for the next loop as well. So we're just gonna create a little bit of easing out and a little bit of easing in at the end. And that way it doesn't look so rigid. All right, once again, let's save just in case. And uh, if we play that back, this should be looking pretty good. Pops up, rolls back and forth, nice. Cool, so that's it for layer three and layer four. We can collapse those and lock them. And uh, let's come on up and go view and clear our guides. And I'm gonna get rid of all my timeline markers as well. It's time to do the small circle. All right, reference footage on. Let's check out our little circle here. So we can see that the little circle first appears on frame one second, 16 frames. Right, so it kind of just pops out of nowhere. And I'm going to place my timeline marker at one second, 16 frames, bring my rulers up and I'll just place a guide so I know where that circle should be. Looking roughly there. It then jumps into the air and comes to the top of that jump at one second, 20 frames. So 
So we'll place our guide there so we can see how high up it needs to jump. And then on two seconds, two frames, our ball makes contact with the square below it. Okay. It then rolls across that square. So let's go and plot that out. It gets to the end of that movement at, let's call it two seconds, 22 frames. Place a marker there. It then holds that position until we get to three seconds, five frames. <clears throat> three seconds, five frames, and then rolls back across to the center of the square. And I think we can call it at four seconds exactly. All right. So overall, six keyframes that we're going to need for our small circle. Let's come back and turn off our reference. Let's grab our small red circle here and let's position it correctly. It is already kind of in the right position actually. For there, P for position, and we're going to create our first position keyframe. Now, before we have it move, let's also just deal with the fact that it needs to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Now, there's a couple of ways we could do this. We're gonna use the opacity way. So I'm gonna hold down shift and hit T. That opens up my opacity options. And at one second, 16 frames, we're going to have an opacity keyframe at 100%. One frame backwards on one second, 15 frames, we're going to have opacity at zero. We could also scale it. We could also cut the layer or trim the layer shorter. But the transparency option works a little bit better for us today. All right. And with that done, we can now have our ball moving. So we're going to move to one second, 20 frames, and I'm going to bounce the ball into the air. About there. I'm just going to preemptively grab my convert vertex tools and just click on those keyframes to get rid of the handles. And then we can go to two seconds, two frames and bring our ball straight back down again. All right, we can get rid of our guides. So I'm just going to go to view clear guides. And uh, we are then going to continue from here. So we then have our ball moving across our square. Let's, um, well, let's add easing first, actually. Let me not get ahead of myself here, I apologize. Let's do the graph for the ball bounce just so it comes in nicely and then we can move on to the sort of rolling motion. So one of our position keyframes selected, let's dive into the graph editor. And exactly as we did for the square, we're just going to create a big trough over the second keyframe. And that will have it just popping into existence quite nicely. Okay, so just a big peak trough and then another peak at the end. Now we can move on to doing the rolling motion. So we're gonna to go to two seconds, 22 frames, and we're gonna shift the ball across and up slightly. So it looks as though it's rolling across the top of that square. And uh, once we've got this key's position, we are going to right click in, uh, on it and select toggle hold keyframe. I'm stumbling over my words today. This house is freezing. I do apologize. All right, so right now we've got this motion, but it doesn't look as though it's actually rolling across our square. So uh, what we need to do now is we're actually gonna grab our Convert Vertex tool yet again. And this time we are going to use it to help us add a curve. So by clicking and dragging on the keyframe, if I sort of just move my circle out the way, there's the last keyframe I made. Clicking and dragging on that with the Convert uh, Vertex tool provides me with a handle. And if you roll that back, we kind of get the illusion of it rolling across. You don't have to spend too much time finicking with these handles just yet. Um, it is going to sort of change once we play with the actual easing in the graph editor for the ball as well. But just as long as we have one, we're good. We're then going to go to three seconds, five frames, and we're going to make an empty keyframe here. So I'm just going to come over to the far left and click on the empty keyframe button there. And this one I'm going to apply easing to. So just hit F9 and then it rolls back across to our center of the square. So I'm just gonna move it across to the center there and down. 
and then once again I am going to grab the convert vertex tool click and drag on the latest keyframe that was made and that's going to allow me to create our curving path there all right and with that done let's dive into the graph editor and see what we can do so we've got our initial pop into midair that's great and uh, what we then need to do is for our next little loop here we're just going to have it roll slowly so a little bit of easing out and a little bit of easing in and you'll see that that now does affect my handle so i can actually just as i'm scrubbing through where i see my ball isn't making contact i can adjust my curve as i need to there so that gets quite intense. I might need to make a null to help me sort of just get that, but that's looking kind of right. Yeah. I can always come back and spend more time on it later. Moving on to the next one, we're also going to have a little bit of easing out and a little bit of easing in as it rolls across. You can make adjustments to your path there. Okay. And there we go, we now have that nice rolling motion. Let's save again. And the next thing that needs to happen is, um, before I forget, we're just going to set toggle hold keyframe to our last position here. This becomes important later, I'll explain once we start doing the scaling away. Um, okay, so the next thing that happens is our shapes then all sort of blow out. So they move sort of towards us and they scale up as they do so and then they all disappear at different rates. Okay. So let's plot this out. Let's get rid of all of my timeline guides. And we're then going to finish up the actual motion and then we can dive into the color changes. All right, so what we've got here is our shapes kind of start expanding from four seconds, eight frames. I'm just gonna place my first time marker there. And I'm just going to time out the rounded rectangle first. We'll do that and then we'll do the other shapes accordingly. So the rounded rectangle gets to its maximum size at 418. And what I'm going to do is while we're at this size, because they all seem to sort of get to their max size around this moment. So I'm just going to place a guide for my rounded rectangle there and then my rounded rectangle disappears on frame four seconds 24 frames so we've got that there okay then let's turn off our video reference and let's do the rounded rectangle so i'm going to unlock layer six hit p for position hold shift and hit s for scale and i am going to create empty keyframes there we don't need to worry about having toggle hold set on the last um, keyframes of the batch because there's no movement after that point. It stayed in this position the entire time. Okay, so moving over then to four seconds, 18 frames, I'm going to grab my layer six and I'm gonna increase both of its scale values by 10%. So 110, 110, and I'm going to move it down to that position there. Okay. And we're going to move over to four seconds, 24 frames, and I'm going to change both scale values to zero and zero. Let's grab our reference footage again and do the big red circle next. So the big red circle stops scaling just after. There we go, there. So at 421, the big red circle stops scaling. So I'm just gonna move, oh, come on, Jason, cold fingers. 421 there. So that's where our ball is going to be at its largest size and I'm going to place a marker for the large red circle and then it disappears at five seconds one frame. All right, we can do that next. So let's grab our big red circle, P for position, shift S for scale. We'll make our first scale keyframe and we'll make an empty position keyframe. And I'll just apply easing there. Moving over then to four seconds, 21 frames. We're gonna increase our ball scale to 110% and we're gonna move it up onto our guide. And then we're gonna move over to five seconds, one frame and change our scale to 0%. All 
All right, so that then has that scaling away. Let's then grab our reference footage once again. Our square gets to its maximum size on, let's call it frame four seconds, 23 frames. I'm going to place a marker down on my visual timeline and in my sort of viewing panel and then turn off our video reference. Let's grab layer four. We're not gonna animate layer three. We're just gonna animate position and scale for layer four. Empty position keyframe, new scale keyframe. And uh, we'll set those at four seconds, eight frames. And then we're gonna move out to four seconds, 23 frames, and we're gonna increase our scale by 10. Now you see that your black square scale is sort of, uh, it's not 100. The reason is that it is taking on the scale value of the, the null that it's been parented to. So that's technically the null's scale value there. Just add 10 to it. So from 69 to 79, and then up, we'll move its position to where we had our guide set. Okay, and then just to see when it disappears fully, that disappears on frame five seconds, two frames. So at five seconds, two frames, I'm going to have my scale then go down to zero and it disappears. And then lastly, the small red circle. So it stops scaling at, let's see here, let's call it five seconds exactly and it disappears on frame uh, five seconds, four frames. All right, so turn off our video reference, small red circle, let's make empty keyframes for position and let's grab a scale keyframe as well. And we can apply easing to both of these. The reason why we applied toggle hold on this previous key is because it would have made a handle as well and that handle would have really made it difficult to maintain that swooshing motion across the square and then moving straight up into the air. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the five second mark. We're going to increase our scale to 110 and just to see where the ball is, let's place a guide. Let's move the ball straight up. And then at five seconds, four frames, our scale can go down to zero. All right, I recommend you save and let's play back what we've got so far. We do need to go into the graph editor for everything disappearing at the end, but uh, for the most part, it's looking pretty good. So we're gonna do the same thing for all of these layers. Um, so I'm just gonna grab the position and scale keyframes for layer six, dive into the graph editor and just zoom in here. And what we're gonna do is we're going to click and drag the handles from the center, so the second keyframe on four seconds, 18 frames. We're gonna push the left hand handles all the way to the left. I'm gonna to have to just grab the green handle for that rotation there. So those are going all the way to the left and then the handles on the right are going all the way to the right. like so. And this has our shapes then popping away from each other. So we'll sort of be able to see them a little bit better once they're all doing it. But once we have our key set like this, it pops away quite nicely and then disappears quite quickly. So that's what we're going for there. And we're gonna do the same for all of those layers. So exactly what we've just done, just grab the next layer and make sure that we're essentially just pushing the left and right handles away from each other from that second keyframe. Cool. So if we play this back, this should look fairly decent. It'll pop away at the same time and disappear at the same time. There is a little bit of overlap occurring here though on my red circle. So what I'm gonna do is just dive into the graph editor there. And um, for the keyframes on four seconds, 11 frames, I'm just gonna pull those 
to make a very sharp peak there so it pops straight into the air. That way we just don't have that visual overlap. Okay, and that is that for our shapes. We are done, well done. Let's clear our guides. So view, clear guides, get rid of my rulers. And now, after saving, we can do our color changes. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to unlock all of our layers, um, except for the video layer, we don't need that. I'm gonna hit Command or Control A to select all my layers and I am going to collapse them. Then we are going to change the color of the square null to yellow just so that we've got a uniform group and let's unshy our assets here. Let's turn on the visibility for all of our green layers. And you'll notice that the only thing that we need to adjust is just having the opacity for the small white circle be adjusted there. So let's just quickly dive in to layer seven. We can hit T for opacity. And if I grab layer two and hit T for opacity, I can then just make first keyframe on one second, 15 frames at 0%, and then one second, 16 frames at 100%. Okay, and now everything should be moving as it should. The white layers are all following the layers that they've been parented to, so they do the exact same thing. Cool. Let us then plot out when our colors change. So I'm going to make a marker at the very beginning of the timeline, and I'm going to call that W for white. Color changes to the red background at frame one second, one frame. So I'll make a marker, and I'm just going to label that as R for red. Remember, you can label these by double clicking on them. Then changes to white again on frame one second, 11 frames. Turns red on two seconds, two frames and white again on four seconds, nine frames. And that's the end of it there. We're gonna make some backgrounds now and we're gonna have those change color. And then that way we'll obviously know which assets to have at what time. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come up to layer new and we're gonna create a solid. So that's layer new solid, shortcut is control or command Y. And we're going to have that as a white background. We're gonna say, okay. And we're going to drag and drop that to the very bottom of the layer stack. So it now sits below our assets. Cool, so that's our white solid. Let's move on until we have our red circles on screen. And what we're gonna do now is make another solid layer. So we're going to go layer new solid. And we're gonna grab the eyedrop tool and just click on the red in our circle there so we can get our color. And that will then be our second. Let's actually drop that to the bottom there. Okay, and uh, we can just label then layer 11 as W and we'll label layer 12 as R. What we're gonna do is we're going to trim the white background. So right now it's sitting on top of the red layer. So we are only seeing the white, but when we get to one second, one frame, what I want you to do is hit Command or Control Shift D. And that will split duplicate the layer. So that's Command or Control Shift D. And we can then move over to one second 11 frames and you'll see that our white layer was split now so we've got two white layers and we can actually hover over the edge of w2 and we're going to just click and drag to trim it there so this means that for this section it's going to be red and it will see the white there and we're going to keep doing this so at two seconds two frames we can split duplicate our w2 layer so that's command or control shift d and we can just move our timeline marker to four seconds, nine frames, and drag to shorten our W3 layer there. And that provides us with the long red section here. So now we have our changing color background. Now, to change our shapes, we're gonna do the exact same thing. So we're going to leave the green layers as they are. They're just going to exist underneath and they'll be sort of revealed and hidden as our yellow layers adjust. 
So we're going to go to one second 11, uh, sorry, one second one frame with all of our yellow layers selected. We're gonna hit Command and Control, Shift D to duplicate those. You'll see that they then get split. In order to make them more manageable, we can actually just click and drag any one of the highlighted layers that we have here. Just click and drag to the sit below our reference footage. And now they're just in one block group here. And then we're going to move our timeline indicator to one second, 11 frames and shorten our layers by just clicking and dragging them. And that reveals the white shape below. So then we can go to two seconds, two frames, and we're going to split duplicate them again. So command or control shift D. Let's click and drag the highlighted one to the top of the layer stack, but below our video reference. And we'll shorten it all the way down to four seconds, nine frames. So if you want to take a look at what the layers look like now, we've got our first batch of yellow layers on screen from zero second, zero frames to one second, one frame. The next batch sits on one second, 11 frames and ends on two seconds, two frames. And the last begins at four second, nine frames and ends at the end of the timeline. All right, and then the last thing that I did say we would do is just having the square look as though it's coming up from behind something here. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to grab just without any layers selected. So I'm just clicking off of my layers. I'm going to grab my rectangle tool. I'm going to click on the fill and I'm going to grab the eyedrop tool and just sample that red from my background there. And I'm just going to draw a shape. And uh, I can use my selection tool to then scale that slightly there, just making sure that it covers all the way to the edge. Something like that. This can actually stay here where it is and it only appears for this portion. So I'm just going to move my indicator to one second, one frame and hit Command Shift or Control Shift D. I'll select this beginning portion and just delete that. And then we'll just go to one second, 11 frames and split duplicate there and delete the duplicate. We can move that shape layer down to sit above layer 18. And that's that. We are now done with the animation. Thanks very much, guys. Sorry for the long one, but I hope you found it insightful and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Ciao.